Okay, so next up we have Elena Claire Kofari who is also very well known in this community, I think. <laughs> uh, she co-authored Linguistic Bodies uh, at the end of 2018 with Ezekiel Di Paolo and Hannah de Jäger, um, and has a very wide-ranging philosophy on mind, body, and meaning, I find. So I'll pass the microphone straight away. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I've been learning so much already, and it's just been a real delight. How is the volume and my holding of the mic is good? Okay, so I, I do read a little bit from my philosophical training, um, so I apologize for that. So I'm gonna be coordinating the slides and, and the reading and the microphone. So we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so thanks, I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I have a kind of an epigraph for today. Habit is a second nature that destroys the first. And this is a bit of the concern that I have about linguistic bodies and how we, how we are, what we are, and what we're doing with that. And we'll see how that comes out. So I am going to spend a little bit of time on, do I have a timer person who's timing me? Okay, okay thanks. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on the story about linguistic bodies, which to some people here is really familiar, and some people here the inactive tradition is not to be taken for granted. I'm gonna just try to select the pieces that I think are relevant for where I want to go in that story, which is the idea that this framework can help us have a critical stance on certain widespread habits and practices in how we relate to nature, or the environment, and in how we relate to our technology, um, or how my husband talks about my current project, which is how are we going to save ourselves from the climate crisis if we're staring at our phones all the time. So that's sort of where I'm working towards, and um, towards our participatory ethics, which is how we ended the book, and if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about today as well. So um, to begin, an action is um, a view that cognition is the life-sustaining and world-creating activities of living bodies, or Evan Thompson's slogan that mind is life, so we are not importantly not machines or computers, though we do interact and make meaning in and through them. And the inactive approach to cognitive science draws on a lot of diverse um, realms that you've seen, philosophy of biology, phenomenology, dynamic systems theory, robotics, Buddhism, to offer explanations about our meaning-making activities. And these explanations prefer world involvement over mental representations. And we have been working on scaling this up not just for the meaning-making activities of all these different organisms in relationship to their environment, but to, of course, the human level of meaning-making and inter um, through social interactions. And I, I love this image, and I, I think of it as a very happy one, but I also, today, want to think about how the people in there talking and relating to each other are really turned away from the natural scene that precedes them and that they're building on, so it's sort of a new interpretation for me um, of this image. And so this is some, some background, and some of which has already been highlighted. Uh, the notion of structural coupling, key in biology, uh, still relevant for us. All biological systems are intimately coupled to their environment, meaning perturbations in the environment lead to perturbations in the organisms, systems of closure, and vice versa. And then sense making, which takes a less passive or, or um, equal view of that relationship, and then says sees agency as the asymmetrical regulation or making efforts to regulate that constitutive relationship between the organism and the environment. And then of course from here we go to participatory sense making uh, that I will be, will be talking about later. But I want to think about, what we wanted to think about was, um, do we also constitutively couple to language? Uh, and what does it mean to have our bodily life be the same activity of regulating relations to the world both the regulating is in language and the world itself um, is constituted in utterances and the sort of ideal history. In other words, not tangible, not present, but still very much involved in our sense-making history. What would that look like? And then if we're coupling to these ideal aspects of reality, if our bodies couple to language and to other bodies, how do we also make meaning with animals, with nature, with computers? Those are like the, the new term that I'm trying to to take care. Okay, so why talk about linguistic bodies instead of just human beings or human selves, or more typically in philosophy, the body or the self? 
So we're making an ontological claim about what we are as humans. We are bodies in a plural sense, each one of us. And these bodies should be understood as qualified, possibilized, being what they are thanks to sensitivities and powers particular to language. The enactor of tradition posits three simultaneous entangled dimensions of human bodily living, organic, sensory, motor, and intersubjective that I'll talk about um, in turn very quickly. But the key thing here is that for all dimensions, bodies make themselves as bodies through regulation of their relation to the environment. This is the key idea that we're trying to track um, all along the way. Each exercise, each exercise is an agency of individuating from an environment, generating identity at different levels. The logic here is um, that, that autopoiesis is, has a tension at the core of it, and a never solved, never resolved tension between self-production and self-distinction. So for self-production, the organism, the sensory motor body, whatever it is, has to take in energy, matter, stuff from the environment to produce, but also has to close out, right? Has to identify, identify and individuate out of the environment. I am the agent, I am not the environment. Either of these trajectories taken to its logical extreme would, would kind of negate the other. So it's this perpetual agency, is this perpetual process of dealing with this tension, and we take this to a full existential um, implication by the end of the book. And this happens for organic bodies, um, with, with metabolism is the sort of key usual picture there with sensory motor bodies. We're talking here about habit schemes, schemes of action and world involvement in that way. And then intersubjective bodies, which are precarious processes of self-individuation now in relation to others. And the sense making here is, um, of course, participatory sense making, Hannah de Jaeger's and uh, Ezekiel de Palo's original idea, and this is, I think, Hannah's slide originally as well. Um, we've talked about it a lot already this morning, um, but to be a little bit more technical about it, when each, um, when each body in question is working to regulate and be an agent in relation to its environment, and this is now happens in a situation where there's another agent doing the same thing, an interactional autonomy is generated, where now, in that large, sketchy loop, around the figures on the right, um, that interaction is feeding on the fact that any act that an agent does is also a move in a shared material space and environment. And those moves um, allow for an emergent dynamic that itself holds sway and has a normativity and is hungry to continue its pattern, shall we say, for a certain amount of time, which then comes back to um, affect the possibilities for the participants. So autonomy is a key concept in an action, but there is some heteronomy in participatory sense-making. There is some letting the other in to my sense-making and at the same time letting the interaction in. And um, there are the really typical kind of standard examples of getting stuck in a, in a hallway dance, right? Getting stuck in lockstep with somebody else or entrained in this way where um, despite my intention to go forward and the other person's intention to go forward, moving in one direction li literally physically limits the moves left to the next direction. Um, and this mutual influence between our acts and the interaction um, that then dictates our next steps is witnessed or trying to get off, uh, end a phone conversation when each person wants to end the phone conversation, but the social norm of responding to what somebody says generates another response or reminds you of something else, and it goes on and on. The interaction itself wants to continue despite individual intention not to continue. Um, so we'll come back to this, into this a, a little bit later on. Oh, I think that's actually my phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you can, can silence it. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, Mark, sorry. Um, <laughs> I guess it's better that it's not someone else's phone. Okay, um, right, so and it's, it's participatory sense-making, we use this a lot in the model to show how we are going to solve these interactional uh, dilemmas in now co-regulating the relation to the environment, acting together to perform that agency that, that regulates the relationship to the environment. So what does this show us about bodies? If we just think about those three dimensions, at each level, bodies are dynamic and precarious processes in time. They are not things, they are constant achievements. They're living enactments of processes. And we are all of these bodies at once, entangled by the life history we write every day. Each concrete practice, act of breathing, holding someone by the hand, 
laughing at a joke, or struggling at work, affirms a process of soft, path-dependent enactment that anchors these bodies together. So we talk about this as entanglement, um, these unique histories of becoming intertwined so that our caring, which is the key structure of sense-making, um, spans these different realms. So here are some examples mentioned in the book. Um, smoking cigarettes is really satisfying at maybe the sensory motor body, body level if you have that habit, possibly even the intersubjective bodily level, but not great for the long-term viability of the organic body, right? Um, so the entanglement does not necessarily mean that everything's working out perfectly for everything. Um, sometimes there's a nice effect where being nice to your spouse will heal wounds faster, says this finding. Uh, Shannon Sullivan anal analyzes this finding that um, in the U.S. anyway, there's a really high rate of preterm births for African-American women. The CDC say, says that this is inexplicable. And she says, well, it's not inexplicable. There are weathering effects of living in a racist and sexist society, and that elevates, that stress elevates cortisol in the body, and cortisol triggers labor, right? So our bodily living is very complex and involves all these different dimensions, and the worlds that we create in our utterances, among other things, um, orders the life that our bodies then lead. I was in a, another version of this talk, I have this long quote from Silvia Federici, which I will skip, but her point in her most recent book is that capitalism turns our bodies into work machines. This is another example of entanglement. They'll become relevant to some of my, um, some of my discussions later on. So the question I have today is what kinds of bodies do our um, engagements with computers and smart technology bring into being and normalize? Right. And vis-a-vis -vis this nature of in, um, entanglement, we, there's, this mo there's this plurality again, this and this diversity, that we are different bodies all at the same time, and that there are then, of course, billions of unique different configurations of bodies in the world. Okay, so when certain conditions hold, such as developing both phylo and ontogenetically in an in-language or a technological, as Yella mentioned, cultural milieu, we enact these multiple relating bodies through a specific kind of agency and become linguistic bodies, which are precarious dynamic processes of navigating dialogic contexts. Linguistic bodies are made up not only of life-sustaining biological processes or action perception schemes or even joint practices that give rise to co-authored subjectivities, but of utterances and the relation between utterances, and I'll talk about utterances in a second. So linguistic sense-making as the activity of linguistic bodies, we say, consists in receiving, producing, interpreting, and reporting utterances, working with them. And so what are utterances? Um, it's certainly not only verbal, it's sort of anything that occupies the turn space of a participant. So they're uh, essentially dialogic acts um, enacted between a mutually recognized producer and audience. They are the ways that participants um, can regulate their relation to an environment together. And they sort of set up interpersonal relations and even through their style and expressivity and the sort of um, producer-receiver relationship create people as people, as persons, right? Um, someone who expresses or can be expressed to. And really importantly, they are both recursive and historical. So we have this concept in the book of utterance braiding. Um, utterances are always made out of pieces of things that have come before, things that people have gestured, said, done, um, written before. And this brings the past always into the present and shapes the future um, of how linguistic bodies are making meanings together. And utterance reporting is sort of the key move at the end of our long diagram, um, where by repeating back, for example, to what, well, let's take the colorless green ideas, sleep furiously, um, case when the, when the woman says, uh, or no, the, I think it was a guy, he says, what? And she like immediately backtracks, right? She just walks it all the way back. But he could have been like, you just said, colorless green something, right? And then he would be reporting to her the utterance, and that allows um, this fusion, this participatory sense-making to come together to fix the interaction, interactional dilemma that has occurred in that case. I was really disappointed that she like walked back from that. I was like, no, stick with it. I guess you told her not to do that probably, right? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> amazing. It's an amazing finding. Okay. Um, so the path to becoming linguistic bodies, which is a path that we never exit, we're always becoming them, 
is characterized by these two ontological features. We discuss full linguistic engagement, um, which I'll talk about in a second, and abiding in potentiality, which means always becoming. So in terms of full linguistic engagement, on our view, infants are fully engaged in participation with adults and children and what we would call linguistic interactions. Um, infants are not only passively exposed to voices and languages in the womb, but from the moment of birth onward, live as needful social beings in messy contexts built by and brimming with language activity. From the start, infants do not simply attend to utterances, the full meaning of which they don't grasp, but with those very utterances are moved, addressed, responded to, in short, engaged, and interactive and recursive coordination in the use of various kinds of social acts. When an adult addresses an infant, even if the adult is adapting or simplifying or scaffolding that interaction, infants are put in contact with the whole of language and placed within the borders of a living linguistic community and human history is brought into their lives. So that complexity um, is there from the start, we think, and actually we're constantly trying to individuate out of it, out of that messiness. So growing up is a matter of individuating ourselves, producing ourselves out of um, utterances um, and the sort of linguistic activity, the languaging around us, and distinguishing ourselves from, from this too, and we have this as an incorporation, incarnation, tension. Um, incorporating is like building up those body schemas of languaging, and incarnation is when that kind of goes awry. Um, I'm thinking of Didier Bottineau's examples from um, A Brave New World of that full internalization of a perspective he was calling it. We call that incarnation, and I may talk about that a little bit later. So utterances self-directed or not establish frames of reference that influence a linguistic agent's intentions, motives, emotion, what she can make sense of and how. And while sustaining these flows, a linguistic agent is then capable of coupling with other linguistic agents in dialogue. So who a linguistic body is at any given moment is a network of flows and frames of these utterance moves that have been incorporated into the body's sense-making style. So think about reading a novel and you are in that flow and you have a certain interaction right after you put down that book versus watching the news, right? So, and, in, and it's not to say that you are um, a completely different person from each interaction, but rather there are these regional identities sort of matching the emergent micro-identities in Varela, DiPaolo talks about these regional identities. So, um, and then there's this historical sense too that there's particular sets of these utterance management habits that are who you are and will be regularly displayed by an agent depending on current activities and context, um, context performance. These are just some pictures of bodies. As John Dewey, the habit genius, puts it, in actuality, each habit operates all the time of waking life Though like a member of a crew taking his turn at the wheel, its operation becomes the dominantly characteristic trait of an act only occasionally or rarely. The habit of walking is expressed in what a man sees when he keeps still, even in dreams. Everything that a man who has the habit of locomotion does and thinks, he does and thinks differently on that account, says Dewey about, about walking. And we're saying everything that a linguistic body does and thinks, she does and thinks differently because she's this kind of body. And so in collective and individual ways, language is the habit that we are, the habit that structures our self-directed utterances into a vantage point that we call home, the habit that calibrates our entangled bodily dimensions to live out the paradox of our conditions in ways that we recognize as fundamentally human. I'm now gonna go really quickly into a little bit more about how we get utterances out of bodily social acts. This is a lot of chapters of the book, so I'm, I'm going quite fast here. Um, but the idea is that we, um, from embodied collaborative sense-making, you have codi codified sedimented acts and spontaneous solutions always intertwining. Uh, social acts of linguistic bodies have proximate meaning meanings of local negotiation and ultimate meanings of community-wide norms. So navigating a cheek-kiss greeting is at once an issue of present particular personal encounters and a matter of cultural competence. Right, or if you want to uh, enthusiastically celebrate good news with a friend, are you going to hug or his fist bump or high five? And there's all sorts of particulars that will inform this choice, but it, these, the choice depends on the bodies, uh, the options being available and ready to hand for those particular bodies. And then if you get more technical, you can know that I either all of those acts, hug, fist bump, high five, are not, um, they're partial, they require another person to complete them, and they're not compatible with each other. So if, like, if I'm trying to fist bump and you're trying to have a hug and one of us doesn't adjust, 
you know, it's not going to go well. And you can, you can resolve this situation spontaneously. Um, you can also use the, the act to kind of dictate what's going to come next, either by like, you know, persistently holding out your hand for a high five that's being missed, or even using another um, social act like words to remedy the situation and say like, don't leave me hanging. Like we try to teach our five-year-old this, like when someone puts their hand out, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to respond. Um, so these are social acts and partial acts. We don't have to worry about the definition too much here. Um, partial acts can become a normative sort of recursive regula like regulation of what's to come, what's to meet them. And so we, through this long diagram, um, which I won't really talk about, emphasize the bodily historical nature of solving these problems and of building up repertoires, but those repertoires always have to deal with the spontaneous needs of the moment. So as participants gain experiences in solving interactional dilemmas, they adjust their habit repertoires, our bodies learn and change, um, and this process is driven on by a tension at every single level of this model, which is the same tension you saw in the very early diagram in the talk, um, between kind of creative local so solutions and more embedded embodied solutions, also between needs of production and distinction, um, and the, norm the other dialectical tension between individual versus interactive normativities. Participatory sense making gets this whole thing going, but of course introduces this tension between an interactive normativity and an individual normativity, and it is um, in the constant trying to act together to resolve that tension that generates the further tensions, and what, what happens um, ultimately, it's, not a it's a conceptual progression here, not a developmental one. You get, because I think utterances, like I said, are there actually all the way at the beginning of an individual's life, but conceptually you get to utterances eventually um, as this tool of co-problem solving, and these afford fancier social acts and couplings, and of course, um, facilitate creating whole ideal realms that we then live in. And the existential tension at the end um, between incorporation and incarnation is really um, the tension between, okay, so with utterances, the ever-present threat that's existential um, is the fact that we're building ourselves out of other people's habits by incorporating utterances. And there's a pull um, not just to lift the act and its possibilities from one concrete instance into your own repertoire, but to incarnate the whole context, style, and manner of another's habit, um, which creates this tension between being one's self and being open to new arrangements, basically. For beings that enact their bodily life as linguistic bodies, the constitutive habits of language therefore ramify all the way down, and the matter of which utterances are taken into oneself and how is of the utmost significance. Okay, so this is the point at which we have this major kind of break in, or in philosophy um, from Aristotle onwards, also Max Scheler, Martin Heidegger. You know, we are distinct. We're the animals with speech and reason. Um, and this abysmal difference allows us to sort of separate from and dominate the rest of living nature. Great chain of being kind of idea. Um, and this is problematic. I'm not going to belabor this point as much as I do sometimes in other talk, but we say that the difference is actually, the difference between us and the rest of the natural world is not language or speech or reason. It's that because of linguistic utterances, we are perpetually becoming and kind of put off our final teleology in a way that other living beings sometimes don't. But we do reject this sort of ultimate divide. It is a continuity view, the continuity of life and language. But I can't argue with some of the dangers that seem inherent in our languaging abilities, including dangers of mastery over nature or alienation from, from nature. And the danger that I want to explore is that our linguistic habits themselves can foreclose the definitive possibility of being a linguistic body, which is the possibility of decentering one's perspective by incorporating the voices of others. So that incorporation is, is our word for the good thing, and the incarnation is the threatening thing. And then there's also this possibility of alienation. So I'll go now into the sort of environmental technological part of the talk. So ecophenomenologist David Abram notes that Western philosophy since Aristotle has seized upon language as the site of radical human difference from the rest of the animal order and the justification for our unchecked manipulations and exploitations of the natural world. 
But Abram notes two things that, first of all, this separation from nature is not just a philosophical abstraction, it's our lived reality in, in many cases. But at the same time, not all human communities have severed themselves in this way. He argues that the habits of literate alphabetic cultures reorient perceptual sensory coupling from a rich living environment that would have included non-human sense makers and meanings to marks on a page, or now marks on a screen. He writes, the participatory proclivity of the senses was not lost, right, because linguistic bodies are always bodies, but transferred from the depths of the surrounding life world to the visible letters of the alphabet. With the development of phonetic rather than pictorial alphabets, each image now, now came to have a strictly human referent, a gesture or sound of the human mouth. For Abram, this is how so many communities and cultures forgot how to be addressed by non-human voices, developing entrenched habits of dealing only with human perspectives, all symbolic images functioning solely as mirrors reflecting the human form back on itself. And so this is sort of a, I want to call like a collective solipsism, which um, is not the only relation that we have to have in languaging, but is one that I think is familiar now. And here's a sort of critique of it based on biosemiotician Wendy Wheeler's work um, in the book Expecting the Earth, and I just want to focus on a small part of this. She says, organisms all have expectations and are, so to speak, expected by Earth systems in which they are integrated as both the maid and the makers. Expectations are important, an important part of what it means to be alive. No life walks or crawls or swims around expecting nothing. But to expect something is to be in relation to it. And as Abram suggests, via language, and in particular the Western deployment of Enlightenment ideals, we no longer expect the Earth in terms of standing in meaningful, reciprocal, precarious relation to it, but we expect an email reply in 24 hours. Or we expect our homes to be heated accordingly to rem according to remotely controlled schedules and our calendars to sync across devices. The complex, intertwined habits of our civilization, particularly where production, consumption, and treatment of the environment are concerned, Therefore, project an imaginary future of limitless resource and expansion while causing a future of planetary devastation. So there's a hard misalignment between our, our habits and the future that is coming regardless of what our schemes of meaning making or comfort require. This misalignment is possible, I think, because of our ongoing self-construction out of utterances, which can take many forms. It's certainly neutral. Um, being a linguistic body is by no means a good or moral thing. It just is what we are. Right? We build and live inside worlds that can be alienated or alienating. So I'm getting a lot of traction myself out of this really long quote, but I'll just read parts of it. And I, I deliberately didn't tell you who it's by yet to see if you know. Um, so the writer says, the fact that individuals bind themselves with strong emotional ties to machines ought not in itself to be surprising. The instruments man uses become, after all, extensions of his body. And to operate them skillfully, we must internalize aspects of them in the form of kinesthetic and perceptual habits. They become literally part of us and modify us and alter our basic affective relationships to ourselves. Um, I'll skip down a little bit. Being the enormously adaptive animal that man is, he's been able to accept as authentically natural such technological bases for his relationship to himself and for his identity. Perhaps this helps to explain why he does not question the appropriateness of investing his most private feelings in a computer. But then such an explanation would also suggest that the computing machine represents merely an extreme extrapolation of a much more general technological usurpation of man's capacity to act as an autonomous agent in giving meaning to his world. And of course, I'm so happy to see all these counterexamples to this in our workshop. It is therefore important to inquire into the wider senses in which man has come to yield his own autonomy to the world viewed as machine. I'm just curious if anyone knows where this is from or has any guesses. Because to me, it's, it's, very, it's even more striking when you find out where it's from. I mean, you have this telltale anachronism of saying man all over the place. So, so it can't be that recent, but apart from that, it sort of sounds like this statement about relating to Facebook, right, or, or social media, or certainly a mobile phone. This was actually um, Weizenbaum in 1976 who programmed um, ELISA, this early artificial intelligence program that functioned in, in one of the early formations like a Rogerian psychotherapist. So the program could feed back to the patient whatever the patient said. It would use certain trigger words and scaffold back, um, bootstrap back sort of uh, statements that sounded like it was listening to you, it heard you. Oh, so you, you mentioned your mother, tell me more about your mother. And you know, could, could go back to certain words later on and it's a really interesting discussion of how it worked, but 
what is striking to me is that Weizenbaum was very upset by how people responded to his program, that, that even psychotherapists published articles saying, well, this is great for our field. So many people will be helped by this program. And he was like, it's not, <laughs> it's not a therapist. It's, it doesn't know what it's doing, right? Um, there are some, we are not machines, and there are some decisions that are not appropriate for machines to make that cannot be satisfied by an effective procedure. And that's very clear in his book, in his 1976 book. So um, there are two things I think are really interesting in that, in that long passage, and one I'll come to is about context, but th the first one is his, his, in his notion of this intense bodily coupling with our technology, and so there's so many headlines today like this. These are all from pop science, but I'm finding more academic ones more recently. Um, everything you need to cure your smartphone addiction, GPS is making our brains lazy, or your smartphone is hijacking your brain, here's how to stop it. Is there an app for that, though? And I love that tagline because and my brother, who's an app designer, kind of pointed this out to me, right? Like, there's a sensory motor satisfaction in picking up your phone and unlocking your phone, holding it, scrolling, right? And the apps that are going to help you manage your time need you to pick up your phone and unlock it and scroll. So they're continuing that positive feedback loop, right? They're, they're continuing to, to promote your engagement with the machine. So this decoupling is very hard to, to realize, maybe. Um, and then I just thought this was really... Remarkable. Um, now we can be concerned how you relate to the holding of your phone. And if you're a man, you need to not look weak while checking your iPhone, but like a badass instead. And <laughs> here's, some, here's some tips. Um, but what, what's interesting here is that holding the phone is so natural that we don't ask if we should hold it. We ask, you know, are we protecting our fundamental human embodiments like gender while we're holding it? So it's funny, but it's also not. <laughs> Um, so as I said in, uh, in his own critical response to how people responded to Eliza, Weizenbaum emphasizes the importance of context for language understanding. So he was like, you know, this program works the way a fortune teller works. You are supplying the context. And so it's a very one-sided interaction, and it seems to be fine. Um, we re rely on context to make sense, and although we initially create context in our languaging and with our utterances, when we couple to certain utterance flows or certain objects of our own creation, we are in effect letting our language dictate context that the rest of our entangled bodies live in and through. And the folks who have been talking about um, restoring agency in our relations with technology, I think are very aware of the fear that I'm talking about. But I have two more kind of quick examples of a disordered way that our language is organizing our bodily life. And this is um, Shoshana Zuboff, whose recent book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism, is what I'm drawing on here. There's lots of um, examples that are relevant to bodies, how every facet of our experience is renderable as behavioral surplus, that is as data, that is as value that can be extracted from our bodies, our bodies again being turned into the work machines of capitalism now in a different way. Um, okay, so particularly relevant to my purposes, she writes about the threat of uncontracts, that they pose a threat to an uh, essential aspect of linguistic being, namely our access to and use of the future tense. And she writes, our hearts pump blood, our kidneys filter that blood, and our wills create the future in the patient discovery of each new sentence or step. This is how we claim our right to speak in the first person as the author of our futures. So note that our human relation to the future is by necessity a relation to uncertainty and a relation to each other. She says also the promise of the promise and the will to will remind us of that place where humans heal the breach between the known and the unknown, navigating the seas of uncertainty in our vessels of shared promises. But surveillance capitalism doesn't like solidarity and it doesn't like uncertainty. It wants knowledge and predictable outcomes above all. So she calls the uncontract um, the form of legal agreements that you make when you purchase a sleep number mattress or the Nest thermostat or if you have a car loan that's synced to automotive telematics that can remotely shut down your car if you don't pay your bill. And she says that all of these transform the human legal and economic risks of contracts, right? Contracts as this living agreement between people uh, into plans constructed, monitored, and maintained by private firms for the sake of guaranteed outcomes. What we're giving away then in our subjection to such a system is the possibility of dealing with the unexpected that comes up in life and dealing with it together, which could mean modifying or redrawing the terms of the original agreement, which on my view is what language is for in the first place, especially if you think about that importance of reporting utterances and working with utterances together. So when I make a promise, I say, I'll do these things, I'll show up to this talk, I'll have the money by tomorrow, 
what we really mean is this is my intention and you bear witness to it and you help me stick to it if the way changes <coughs> or we change it together. And in action, this is called laying down a path and walking and it's how babies learn to crawl and run and talk and it's how meaning is made in conversation. It's how bodies work, um, but it's not how automated society built on predict and control algorithms would work. And what I hear as the real fear in her account is not just the end of our um, authorship of our future, but the end of a collective, collaborative authorship through genuine interaction and participation. I have to skip this cartoon because people said it was really distracting, but it's Google determining the future through its search engine results. So why are we subjecting ourselves to these non-relations, these non-expectations, or the abbreviation of our potentials as linguistic bodies? And here I turn quickly to um, <coughs> philosopher of science Maria Brinker. Who's, who uses the ecological, psychological notions of embodiment and environmental affordance to talk about these choices. And she says that choice as the exercise of agency depends upon, again, that word, context. And the problem with our currently largely unregulated digitized worlds of surveillance, hidden audiences, and secondary repurposing of data is that it turns public spaces into unbounded context, spaces devoid of constraints and clues we would use to orient ourselves and act as agents. And so there's this idea of um, facing faceless watchers that highlight not just interactional asymmetries, but s ones that are so extreme that they're more like a panopticon, trading our bodily perceptibility to others and our experiences of that perceptibility in ways that reduce agency. And her example is, you know, if I walk down the street and my neighbors see me, thank you, that's not um, a huge issue for my future, but if the neighbors were to have kind of all this real-time data about me afforded by our groovy new surveillance technologies that are supposed to be helping us live better lives, it would make a really different encounter. Our judgment of what is relevant, of what to do and say in that moment would be overpowered by what we might call the extra situational information and consequences. Um, this is a fear I had when I read the diversity computing article, but I think now seeing Yellow's talk that that was a misplaced fear. But the problem is like, what do we do? Like you were saying, you're talking, what do we do with the data? Right, that it, it is not self-interpreting and it could really push interactions in a not great direction, for example. So she says that on an individual level, people cope with the status quo of personal surveillance that we all kind of know is going on by either denying it, submitting to it, or feeling paranoia and paralysis, but what we don't do is resist. And so my um, kind of radically speculative ending for the talk is that there's another thing we have to explore. We want to envision better relations, but we should understand what we're doing. And um, the theme I've been trying to put to you is that we make ourselves what we are constantly. We're, we're constantly becoming, and we're becoming through interactions. So what kind of interactions are we having? And I um, think that we don't just submit to uh, you know, Netflix or using a Google phone or um, interacting with intelligent softwares or other kind of technologies that we have right now in, in a mainstream sense, um, just, just only out of complete powerlessness or complete subjection to capitalism, although I certainly see those arguments that these women are making too. Um, but also because we like it a little bit, we're used to it. This is what participatory sense making also is, right? It's heteronymous. It's, it's we have a feeling of asymmetry and tension that give interactions their contour or their signature. Um, oh, that came out kind of weird with the animation, sorry. So as linguistic bodies, we interact with all sorts of others that are not always present, including potentially intelligent software agents that could be maybe like a sort of pseudo participatory sense making is going on here. Remember, we've built ourselves up as these flows of utterances as linguistic bodies that allow certain coupling to the world. We can do this on our own. Um, I don't think it's recommended, but I think we can. So we're used to giving up small degrees of autonomy in our interactions. There's a way it feels to interact with another, and we have this feeling even when the other interactor is missing. There's a readiness to interact idea that DePaolo and Diego discuss in their, um, their neuroscience article. And then Yana Popova and I talked about um, how you can do participatory sense making with a narrator when you're reading fiction because there's a there are linguistic clues of um, pacing in the text and that feeling that I'm not controlling the temporal flow of events here gives me the feeling that there's another agent in my sense making here and we kind of generate the identity of the narrator through that interaction. So my question is, you know, 
does that model, could that help us explore our interactions with these technologies? On the one hand, we have the same sort of push and pull experience. Both parties have goals. And so I'm thinking now really specifically of like recommendation services, softwares that are running algorithms that are using information of your likes and preferences to give you something back. Um, so that's, of course, a very narrow thing. But so parties have goals that may or may not be realized in the interaction. There are positive feedback loops, right, where you're getting encouraged to stay on the app or the phone or the software. And um, Christopher Burr, another artic authors of this article in Minds and Machines talks about the hijacking of human minds that is actually, they say, not the fault of intelligent software agents. That's just what happens, but it is also what happens in our interactions too. At the same time, I think it's a little too static. Um, both parties are very rigidly conceived uh, in this view. So there's some evidence that even though I know that what the software is presenting me is not the full set of options, I take it as representative of the full set of options. And at the same time, um, when I give feedback, it does not necessarily mean that it's what I want or what my intention is. It might just be what I can't resist choosing in a controlled context. So neither party is really getting a, a great picture of, of the other. So these are my questions, not conclusions, and then I will be more or less done. Um, is that extension appropriate? Does it fit here? Are recommendations utterances? Do users treat them as such? Like it's telling me to watch or want or buy this. Uh, is interactional autonomy the same thing as a positive feedback loop? Um, how would our face-to-face -face interactions be changed if they're mediated more directly by technologies of bodily surveillance? And how are we being changed by regularly participating in one way, pseudo participatory sense-making interactions with intelligent machines? And this is something that um, like when Omar said before that we want to make computers that reflect how people think, I'm worried about how we already think differently because of our regular engagements. And so really, really quickly what we end with is this idea that um, everybody participates. And so it's not even enough to look at interactions, but to encourage and support um, all these different bodies and their becoming to participate and to participate critically in interactions. And I think that that does echo the goals of some others here as to what we'd like the technology to do. So I will um, just leave it there and stop talking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> So wow, um, the, the last part we need to think more because it was a lot <laughs> to <laughs> take in. So it's that. still in my mind, but I had another question already earlier. Um, and the question is, so like I'm totally with you, but now I'm gonna play the devil's advocate. There's a philosopher in our department, Peter Paul Verbeek, and he's always very critical of, for example, traditional phenomenology in the sense of Heidegger. Uh, being very critical of technology, right? And seeing sort of doom scenarios. Right. And um, now I was wondering how you look at that, whether you really see technology as such as very problematic, uh, just or, or that it's really about what we, how we design it or what we do with it. And maybe even if we think that it's, there is some really deep problems with technology and it's doing and this whole surveillance capitalism it, that's just what you get from from enlightenment until now that's just what you uh, we can't really stop it mm -hmm. then even so he would say well it doesn't do good to stand on the sidelines yeah. and be sort of like an old grumpy philosopher saying well, oh, technology because it's happening anyway so we'd rather dig into it and start helping chips but wh what are your views on that how, how should we act what should we do no, thank you. And it it's feels very awkward to suddenly to stand on this sort of like negative naysaying side. And I don't mean to. So I was just showing in my environmental philosophy class an interview with Heidegger where he's asked if he's anti-technology after he puts out the question concerning technology. And he's like, no, I'm not anti-technology. And then goes on to give all these doomsday scenarios where he really is anti-technology. But um, what he's worried about is kind of what I'm worried about, which is that um, like, like the opening quote, right? Like that our habits erase our first habits, right? That we might reach a point where we can't walk back from what we've done and that what we do runs away from us. So Simone de Beauvoir will say, 
things like, you know, um, man, man is a consciousness, he's free, he invents the atom bomb, and then he has to also suffer the consequences of that, right? So I think there's a lot of clear instances that our technology goes in ways that we're not intending, and I think the whole setting that's important here is capitalism and power and greed. I think the technology that, that you talked about or that Omar talked about is obviously not going in this direction. You were trying to restore authorship and agency. But what will society bear and whose interests will it serve? And I think that, so maybe that's the more appropriate place for the criticism. It's not on the fact that we create things, um, you know, or design technology, but in, in how it's then deployed and what the larger socioeconomic setting is and whether or not we're recognizing the diversity of bodies and the needs of bodies. Because the other kind of part of it that I think Heidegger is also afraid of is our, our capa capacities for abstraction help us to forget the full scope of our own being, right? I don't know. I, my, my commitment so far was just to talk about the things, even though I'm not an expert in environmental philosophy, and so just to start talking about them and see where we go. So that's our shared question. I don't have an answer for that yet. I think some of you have the answers. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Actually, I, I don't quite get the part where you're talking about the continuity from other animals to human beings. But it seems to us that common sense understanding about language is what makes um, us discontinuous from you know, other animals. But you seem to oppose to that idea. Can you specify it? Thank so you. That's a, thank you. It's a really tough question, and that's something that we're planning to work on next more robustly. Um, but there are what seems the most different to me is not necessarily language, because when you break down what's going on in language into this sort of um, shared, so shared social action and, and agency and interaction in that big model, I'm sure there are pieces of that that you can find other species doing, and sometimes a lot of people have brought those examples up to me, but it's that our situation right now is one of kind of constantly becoming and resisting any kind of finishedness to our nature, and it does seem that that is a little different when you look at the animal world, where they you know, a dog is a dog and doesn't fail to be a dog and doesn't sort of have an unfinished relation to dogness, right? The way that humans have an un have a, our own being is an issue for us, right? So that, that is a big difference. I don't think it's the, differ it's the location of difference that other philosophers like typically have, em have embraced. Um, the treating something as something is usually where philosophers draw the line about human versus non-human. But what we're thinking about now is that actually if we look at participation and the event of meaning making in a shared sense, that may become more important than the rigid ontological differences of who is or is not a linguistic body. And so there's this great video clip that I wish I had ready to go. Um, maybe you saw it on the internet where a, a mom is feeding, uh, has some food and wants her baby to say mom. And there's a border collie sitting next to the one-year-old. And she's speaking Spanish, and she's like, "Di mama, di mama, like say mom, say mom. I'm going to give you this food." And the baby's just like looking at her, and um, the border collie really wants the food and gets increasingly agitated, and finally goes, "Mama, mama!" <laughs> right? And like you, I mean, I didn't believe it until I saw the video, but like it's the dog is saying what she wants it to say, <laughs> and then the baby like pushes the dog out <laughs> of the way, like, "Get out of here! That's my cake," you know. Um, and so in that moment, can the dog not be a linguistic body? I mean, there's such a tight um, coordination there, and there's clearly some kind of shared sense making there. And I think you can worry about interior experience and difference of that, but you can also decide that that's not the point of focus for the research project. So I don't think I really answered your question, but we're trying to work towards a more flexible notion of continuity. Uh, that leaves open the door for becoming linguistic bodies, for non-humans becoming linguistic bodies, maybe only in interaction with humans right now, but, but I'm not sure. Thank you for the question. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, uh, just also for the chance of saying what I'm saying. I've been thinking about this for a while, and now I can actually say it to the public. Um, <laughs> One thing that I, that, that I think, and coming back to your question, what do we do? And I think we, th there is like a, an elephant in, in the room in this uh, conversation, and that is the, the ethical stance. 
there is an ethical stance that I think in science we have put on the background. Mm. I think it would be nice to try to do what they've done in the food industry with the slow food idea. I think we should like think of like the slow science I I idea. Some of the things that we critique, we have it in our own system, in science, the way we publish, the way we work, mm -hmm. the way we relate with our colleagues, the way we relate to our students, the way we relate with our university and funding agencies. And that is something that we as a group, not talking just to you guys, but you, we as a group of scientists, we could be changing. At least in our own practices, to start practicing what we preach. That will be, I think, a first step uh, to do something. <laughs> Thank you for having me, giving a, science, that, that a, a chance to talk about slow science, because I always talk about this after a few glasses of wine at dinner, and now <laughs> I'm doing it <laughs> officially at the conference. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing the, the comment. Yeah, great. much, Elena. Uh, we have more coffee next door oh. again, and we can resume here at about three, five past three. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say three.